Okay, so we're going to look at in this video at uh, how to take inverse Laplace transforms of things that are getting a little more complicated. So um, if you haven't watched the previous video, what we were doing is we had something like s plus 6 over s squared plus 9. And we had decided that we wanted to take the inverse Laplace transform of this. And uh, we went to Wolfram Alpha. It took a very nice inverse Laplace transform. We did a few manipulations. I uh, got a nice inverse Laplace transform, which was the same as the Wolfram Alpha one. We plugged this into MATLAB to ask it to do a partial fraction expansion. And we got something that looked kind of frightening in the sense that we have uh, constants, which are complex. We have poles that are complex. Uh, things just look kind of messy. So what I want to do in this video is um, actually go through quite a bit of math to show what happens in this case and how that what the answer we're going to get really is the same as the one that you get uh, if you're doing the Wolfram Alpha approach or the approach we did in the last video. It's going to be um, a little messy, quite a bit of math, and if you're uh, if you uh, are allergic to a lot of math, then you can probably skip this. It won't be damaging to your soul. But you will uh, probably spend the rest of your life wondering, how did that really work? So you, de you decide. Uh, in any case, um, I'll go through the math. And then either at the end of this video or at the beginning of the next, this is turning into a pretty long sequence of videos, uh, I'll talk about how to just uh, look at what you get for the values of r and p, and from that write down what the time function is. It turns out that it's actually kind of slick. So if you're impatient, you just want to know how to do that, um, then fast forward to the end of this video or the beginning of the next, depending on how long we take with the ugly math. But if you want to know how things work, here's your chance to find out. So you'll remember that this um, partial fraction expansion is giving us something that looks like this. And we'll actually plug in the numbers we got from MATLAB. R1 is 0.5 minus j, so 0.5 here, and minus 1 times i, which again, if you're an engineer, is really j, over s minus 3j. That's what we have down here. Plus 0.5 plus j over s plus 3j. Okay, so, so far, so good, hopefully. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of these guys and break them into a sum of two fractions. And the reason I'm going to do that is that that will allow me then to recombine things in ways that make all of a sudden a bunch of stuff sim simplify out. So I have 0.5 over s minus 3j, and then a minus j over s minus 3j, plus 0.5 over s plus 3j, plus j over s plus 3j. Okay, so what I'm going to do then is combine, or at least collect, we're not combining yet, but we will be in a minute, the terms that have real parts as their coefficient, so that'd be these two guys, and then the terms that have these imaginary parts as their coefficients, which would be these guys. Okay, and I'll clean up a bit of stuff here. In fact, we'll actually just get rid of all this stuff so we have room to work with. And uh, keep going. So the terms that have the real parts this is going to be 0.5 over s minus 3j plus 0.5 over s minus or s plus 3j. And then we're going to have a plus 
j over s plus 3j, that's this guy down here, minus j over s minus 3j. Okay, so um, we're making progress. So now we need to um, So um, let's cross multiply these guys. And uh, we're going to take uh, 0.5 times s plus 3j plus 0.5 s minus 3j. Okay, so I'm taking this 0.5, multiplying it by this, this 0.5, multiplying by this. So we've made a big mess. And now we're going to have s minus 3j times s plus 3j. Okay? And rather than uh, work with the blue section, now I'm going to just keep going with this one until we come to a conclusion about what it looks like. And then we'll go back to the blue one. Okay? So 0.5 times s this guy times this guy plus this guy times this guy is going to give us 2.5s times s, which is just s. Okay. This guy times this guy gives us 1.5j. This guy times this guy gives us minus 1.5j. Those ones cancel, which is pretty cool. In the denominator, we have s times s, so that's going to give us an s squared, so that's s times s. We also have s times plus 3j, so that's plus 3js. Now we'll have minus 3j times s, minus 3js, and we'll have minus 3j times 3j. That's this term times this term. Okay, and now some amazing stuff happens down here. The 3js and the minus 3js cancel each other. And I have minus j squared times 3 squared. Well, j squared is negative 1, and 3 squared is 9, so I get in the denominator that this is s squared plus 9. So, in having done this, I have an s in the numerator and an s squared plus 9 in the denominator. If you remember the Laplace transform tables, this is basically the Laplace transform of cosine 3t times u of t. So, by taking just these terms that had the real parts, so uh, this guy and this guy, by taking just the terms with the real parts, we've now got something that gives us a cosine when we do the inverse Laplace transform, s over s squared plus 9. So let's see what happens when we do the blue parts. So we'll cross multiply. We'll have j s minus 3j. So that's this one times this one minus j s plus 3j, so that's this one times this one, over s plus 3j, s minus 3j. Okay, when we work this out, we've got j times s, so j times s minus j times s, that one goes away. And we're left with minus 3j squared, this one times this one, minus j uh, times 3j. So we're going to have a minus 3j squared minus 3j squared. And you'll notice that this denominator, this part here, looks like this part here, this part here, looks like this part here. So the denominator is just going to become s squared plus 9. Well, let's work this out just a little bit. I have a 3 times j squared. 
with j squared again is negative 1. So this is going to be positive 3. So this term right here becomes 3. I have a minus j squared. Again, j squared is negative 1. So that's going to be a plus 3 right there. Okay. So what we end up with over here is 6 over s squared plus 9. And uh, you'll recall that the 6 over s squared plus 9 transforms to 2 sine 3t times u of t. So what we've done is gone to an awful lot of work and effort to get this s over s squared plus 9 and the 6 over s squared plus 9. But it turns out that this is actually still a useful thing because I can look at my original coefficients, which I had a point 5 plus j, and I had a point 5 minus j. You'll notice that this point 5 is half of the coefficient in front of the s over s squared plus 9. And you'll know that the 1 that's multiplying the j here is half of the coefficient that ends up in front of the sine. Okay, Because, again, the sine is going to have a coefficient of 2 in front of it. So by looking at this, we think, well, it might be possible to just look at the real and imaginary parts of our uh, constants and from that write down exactly what the uh, what the uh, uh, transform of the or inverse transform of the sine and cosine should be and it turns out that is truly the case and we'll do that in the next and hopefully last video in the sequence